Biological rhythms that occur daily are observed in most animals and plants, and even some bacteria. In 1971, Ronald Kanopka, working in the lab of Seymour Benzer, was the first to identify a gene that is involved in producing these complex behaviors. This work initiated the study of molecular mechanisms that underlie the circadian clock. As with all research, Kanopka and Benzer began with a question. Are daily biological rhythms determined by external cues or by an internal clock? If such a biological clock exists, it must be genetically encoded. Kanopka hypothesized that if genes control circadian rhythms, then they could be mutated to alter rhythmic behavior. Kanopka chose the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, which exhibits striking circadian behavior that is easy to quantify. Fruit flies can be reared in small spaces on inexpensive food and have very short generation times, making it easy to produce large, genetically diverse populations and to track inheritance patterns over many generations. In the 1970s, even before DNA sequencing technology was developed, there were already sophisticated genetic tools available to create, describe, and identify mutations in fruit flies. Drosophila has four pairs of chromosomes. Like humans, male flies have an X and Y chromosome that determines sex, whereas females have a pair of Xs. Because there is only one copy of the X chromosome in males, mutations and genes on this chromosome are fully expressed, even if recessive, and therefore are easier to identify than autosomal mutations. Konopka used this fact to his advantage through a clever genetic strategy. By using specific genetic backgrounds, he could chemically mutate a male fly and search its male progeny for phenotypes arising from that mutated X chromosome. First, he added a mutagen, ethyl methane sulfonate, to their food to introduce mutations randomly throughout the entire genome. Then, he bred each mutagenized male to an attached X female. In attached X females, the two X chromosomes are joined at the centromere and are unable to separate during meiosis, so they are inherited as a unit. The presence of two X's, such as an attached X, is sufficient to make a fruit fly an egg-laying female even though she also carries a Y. Two possible combinations of this pairing, attached X plus X and Y plus Y, are not viable. The viable offspring of a cross with an attached X female will either be females with mom's attached X and dad's Y, or males with dad's potentially mutated X and mom's Y. If dad's X carries a mutant allele, all the males in the first generation will carry the mutant gene, and none of the females will. Using this approach, only male offspring will show a phenotype related to a mutation on the X chromosome. Kanopka generated more than 2,000 mutant fly lines in hope of finding X-linked mutations that alter rhythmic behaviors, so he needed an efficient assay to see which of the families of flies had changes in daily rhythms. Drosophila is Greek for dew lover, which nicely describes how flies, which evolved in the tropics, emerge from their pupil cases early in the morning when humidity is at its highest levels, allowing them to pump out their wings before they desiccate with the midday heat. Kanopka observed each bottle that held the family from one cross and took note of the general pattern of emergence of adult flies from their pupil cases. Closion. The best mutant candidates were lines of flies in which attached X females emerged in the early hours, but males showed either no preference or emerged earlier or later than females. The pupa from these lines, which carry the potentially mutated X, were transferred to constant darkness to study eclosion rhythms without the influence of light to make sure that the observed rhythms were driven by the internal clock rather than the environment. To perform the eclosion screening, Kanaka used automated bang boxes. A bang box is an apparatus in which pupa are attached to a metal plate that is automatically banged every hour, prompting the flies that have eclosed to fall through a funnel into a chamber where they can be counted. Normally, a population of flies will have an eclosion period of about 24 hours but Kanopka observed three unusual patterns in the males of some lines. A short period, with peaks in eclosion every 19 hours, a long period, with peaks every 28 hours, and males with no observable rhythmic emergence. We'll refer to these fly lines as the long, short, and arrhythmic mutants. 
The assay had some limitations. Defects in eclosion time could be due to disruptions in development, such as changes in a gene that drives eclosion and maturity. Furthermore, eclosion happens once in a fly's lifetime, so patterns can be observed only in populations of flies. Therefore, Kanopka turned to an assay of circadian locomotor rest activity cycles that can be measured in individual flies held in a chamber crossed by two infrared beams. Every time the fly crosses the beam, an event was recorded. Locomotor activity in constant darkness was measured in wild-type flies, where it followed a pattern of activity that repeated about every 24 hours. The flies that had the short eclosion pattern had a short activity period of around 19 hours. Similarly, the long period eclosion mutant had a long period of activity of around 28 hours. And the arrhythmic eclosion mutant had no observable rhythmic pattern to its movements. The observation of phenotypic changes from both assays is important because it suggests that one gene controls the timing of both the one-time eclosion event and the locomotor activity through the fly's lifespan. Furthermore, the isolation of short and long period mutants is important because there are many possible ways in which a fly could be arrhythmic that are unrelated to timing. Once he confirmed the three rhythm phenotypes, Kanopka mapped the mutations to the X chromosome by using their inheritance relative to the observable visual markers that affect phenotype. Drosophila geneticists take advantage of genes with known locations that produce visible phenotypes to infer the locations of new mutations of interest. This is because chromosomes undergo crossing over prior to the formation of haploid egg and sperm cells, in which DNA is exchanged between paired chromosomes. The closer the two genes are, the less likely that crossing over will occur between them. Konopka used visual markers with known locations on the X chromosome to see whether crossing over had occurred between rhythm mutations and visual markers that were carried at different locations on the female's X chromosome. Using this technique, Konopka discovered two important things. The first was that the second generation males that had a rhythm mutation never picked up the two markers closest to the ends of the chromosome by crossing over, meaning that the mutant gene and those visual markers must reside very close together on the DNA. The second was that all three rhythm mutants mapped to the same area on the chromosome. Was it possible that mutations in the same gene led to the short, long, and arrhythmic mutants? To test the hypothesis that the mutant alleles lie in the same gene, Kanopka performed genetic crosses designed to see if they code for the same function. First, he created females that represent all heterozygous combinations for the four X chromosome alleles, and then looked at the resulting rhythms. When either the arrhythmic or the long period allele was paired with the wild type allele, the phenotype was normal. In other words, the arrhythmic and long period alleles were recessive to the wild type allele. The short period allele was determined to be partially recessive because the heterozygote had a slightly shorter period than the wild type, but not as short as the flies that carried two copies of the short period allele. However, when the short and long period alleles were both present in the heterozygote, the rhythm was almost normal. This result could either mean that their alleles are on the same gene and cancel each other out in the phenotype, or that they exhibit what is called complementation. Complementation means that they are on different genes and each mutant chromosome has a wild type allele of the other gene in question, rendering both recessive alleles silent in the presence of a wild type homolog. Evidence for the same gene hypothesis came from crosses of either the short or the long period allele with the arrhythmic allele. In each case, the resulting behavior was short or long, respectively. This led the researchers to infer that the arrhythmic mutation represents a non-functional copy of the same gene that was mutated in the long and short period mutants. Additional crosses supported the hypothesis that all three of these alleles lie in the same small region of the X chromosome. The gene that this paper discovered came to be called period. Today, it may seem obvious that genes control behavior. However, it was the pioneering work of Kanopka and Benzer that finally convinced the skeptical biological community that single genes could determine complex behavior. Before that work, the only available evidence had indicated that behavior is under the control of hundreds, if not thousands, of genes acting together. 
Cloning of the period gene in 1984 in the laboratories of Michael Rosbash and Jeffrey Hall at Brandeis University and Michael Young at Rockefeller University not only earned them the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in 2017, but also initiated the golden age of molecular analysis of the circadian clock. As we continue to make groundbreaking progress in the field of circadian biology, it's fascinating to step back and see where it all started 50 years ago. Mm -hmm.